Good evening to everyone. We're so glad to see everyone here. Um, I'm Maggie Cruzy of the American Folklife Center Library of Congress. And on behalf of my section co-chair, Leonard Norman Primiano, who sends his greetings to every single one of you. Um, and on behalf of all the members of the AFS Folk Belief and Religious Folklife section, we are proud to bring to you this year's Don Yoder lecturer, Dr. Jeff Todd Titan, Professor of Music Emeritus, Brown University. Jeff Todd Titan received the BA from Amherst College and the PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. He has been active professionally both in ethnomusicology and folklore for more than 45 years. He joined the faculty at Tufts University in 1971 and in 1977 was tenured in a joint appointment as associate professor of English and music. At Tufts, he founded the MA program in ethnomusicology, co-founded the undergraduate program in American studies, and taught ethnomusicology, American literature, folklore, and folklife for 15 years. And in 1986, he moved to Brown University as professor of music and directed their doctoral program in ethnomusicology until his retirement in 2013. Um, a member of the Society for Ethnomusicology since 1971, he was editor of its journal, Ethnomusicology, from 1990 to 1995, a member of the American Folklore Society, also since 1971. He was elected a fellow in 1998 and currently serves on the AFS Executive Board. Last Tuesday, he received from his graduate alma mater, the University of Minnesota, their Outstanding Achievement Award given annually to a few alumni in recognition of their leadership in academia, the business world, politics, arts, medicine, and the sciences. Among past recipients of this world, award are Hubert Humphrey and Garrison Keillor. <laughs> Titan says that he couldn't vote for Humphrey in 1968. He voted for Eugene McCarthy, but that if Keillor ran for president, he could vote for him. Uh, beginning in graduate school, uh, Jeff has been an advocate for traditional musicians and their communities. Um, since 1990s, he's been involved in a collaborative project with Old Regular Baptists in southeastern Kentucky at their invitation, helping them to conserve their singing practice, the oldest English language religious music in oral tradition in the United States. Jeff Titan has had a long career as a scholar with numerous articles, films, recordings, and eight books to his credit. Most recently, the Oxford Handbook of Applied Ethnomusicology, co-edited with Svanavor Petten, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2015. Um, I've known Jeff for many years and served on the AFS executive board with him, but I know his field work mostly through cataloging his research collection at the Archive of the American Folklife Center. Um, including his field recordings for Powerhouse for God. And I'm pleased to note that a second edition of um, his book is forthcoming from the University of Tennessee Press in April 2018 for Power Powerhouse of God. At the American Folklife Center, we look forward to receiving Jeff's papers in addition to the collections we already have there. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to tonight's topic. Jeff Titan was the first to propose that musical cultures could be understood as ecosystems in the first edition of his Worlds of Music in 1984. Currently, he is known for developing an ecological approach to musical and cultural sustainability. In 2012, he issued a, an appeal for a sound commons for all living creatures, part of his current project in ecomusicology eco that theorizes a sound ecology, a book of essays on musical and cultural sustainability written by colleagues and former students in his honor, is forthcoming in 2018 from the University of Illinois Press. Uh, following Jeff's talk, um, our wonderful colleagues, Mary Hufford and Rory Turner, um, have prepared responses. And following this, we will have discussion and questions, and we look forward to a wonderful session. Now, please give a warm welcome to Jeff Todd Titan, whose Don Yoder lecture is titled, Eco-Justice and Folklife. Thank you all and thank you for coming. Thanks to Maggie and to Leonard for inviting me to 
give this talk and uh, to Mary and Rory especially uh, for their willingness to to serve as as uh, commenters discussants uh, uh, I'm very happy that uh, that they agreed to do this I've admired their work for a long time and in a sense we're, we're in this together so uh, I'm eager to hear what they have to say uh, I don't have the right glasses for this. I'm going to have to hold it up a little. Um, I'm not a great reader of my own words. <laughs> Do my best. Come on in. <laughs> None of your seats. So the, talk, the title of my talk is Eco Justice and Folk Life, and I have a little uh, slide up there with the title of the talk. And um, in the midst of an environmental crisis. The disproportionately affects disadvantaged populations, a crisis signaled by climate change, by rapidly intensifying weather extremes, by a warming planet, an accelerated species extinction. A few thoughtful people have wondered if indigenous ecological knowledges about nature and the place of humans within nature offers any hope for social and environmental justice and for our collective survival. 156 years ago, Thoreau gestured away from the anthropocentric and toward the ecocentric when he wrote that he wished to regard the human being as, quote, an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society only. Taking indigenous ecological knowledges seriously requires a willingness to entertain an ecological rationality that treats the forces and beings of nature plants and animals and landforms as if they deserve the respect that governs, or rather should govern, relations among all beings. Scholars operating in an academic atmosphere of scientific realism have documented indigenous people's beliefs about nature, but until recently, they've either denied their truth or they've bracketed, that is, they've temporarily set aside the truth claims of indigenous ecological knowledges while emphasizing that they're pragmatic and consequential for the people who hold them. Yet, as Yale religion and ecology professor John Grimm writes, quote, religious concepts and practices among indigenous peoples are both culturally differentiated and cosmologically integrated. Religion should not be studied as separated from other indigenous social expressions, structures, practices, symbols, rituals, cosmologies, and ethical behaviors or social adaptations to historical interactions." Unquote. The same can be said about the customary beliefs and practices of traditional groups, communities, and societies that have long been the object of folk life studies, something that Don Yoder, after whom this lecture is named, knew well. Insofar as we're coming to realize that the techno-scientific lifeways and instrumental rationality of the developed world may not be so well adapted to survival and justice after all, we may wish to reconsider the truths of indigenous and folk ecological knowledges. If, for example, we come to believe that all beings are related, that as Grimm puts it, quote, kinship extends from human communities into biodiversity, bioregions, and stars and planets, unquote, then we may set ourselves on a path toward eco-justice and an ecological rationality based in collective rights and responsibilities. An ecological rationality that turns on the relatedness of all beings is congruent with the fundamental principle of ecological science, namely that all beings are interconnected and that a change to any one affects a change in everyone. In 1866, four years after Thoreau died, Ernst Haeckel invented the science of ecology and defined it as the, studies of, as the study of organisms, that is, of beings, and their relations to each other and to the surrounding environment. Deriving from this fundamental ecological principle of interconnected relation are three important fields of action in an ecological rationality. One, the community of interrelated beings. Let me see what my next slide is. That has the principle of interconnected relation in the three fields, 
the first one of community and place. Uh, the second, the ways that beings participate in that community and place. And third, the relations of nature and the non-human world to humans and human nature. An ecological rationality requires a relational ontology and epistemology, that is, a relational way of being and knowing. In this lecture, I would ask that you keep that first principle and the three fields of an ecological rationality in mind the principle of interconnected relation and the fields of community place, participation in nature, human nature. I will argue that for humans, the problem of eco-justice in a sustainable world is more than a problem of science and technology. It's more even than a problem of ethical behavior towards other beings. Ultimately, it's an ontological as well as an epistemological problem. I resist any simple equation of this ontology with identity or this epistemology with a mixture of nature and culture. The problem of eco-justice in a sustainable world isn't merely a problem of what to do. It rests more deeply in how humans locate our beings and the beings of others in that world. The problem of eco-justice rests in who we think we are and how we come to know ourselves and our relations with other, with other beings in the world. An ecological rationality of interconnectedness and collective well-being must come to replace our current economic rationality of self-interest, growth, and the maximization of material wealth if we're ever to bring eco-justice and survival to a sustainable planet. An ecocentric rather than an anthropocentric framing is required, and this is one of the tasks of eco-justice. In this lecture, I want to claim that folk traditional and indigenous ecological knowledges have a role to play in eco-justice. And in a few minutes, I'll bring to bear a case study in the traditional ecological knowledge of one of the folk groups that I've spent several decades with, illustrating how they embody the main principle and the three fields of an ecological rationality. I'll conclude with a gesture to my current project of a sound ecology, a thought experiment in which sounds rather than texts or objects enable the connections that lead to sound experience, sound communities, sound economies, and a sound ecology. A sound ecology embodies an ecological rationality aimed at who we think we are, how we know what we know, and what we can do to bring about eco-justice in a sustainable world. But before suggesting how folk life studies may contribute to an ecological rationality for eco-justice, I need to define eco-justice and introduce the idea of justice itself. A good shorthand definition of eco-justice belongs to Dieter Hessel, who wrote that eco-justice combines ecological responsibility with social justice. For Hessel, social justice means fair treatment for all beings, human and otherwise. Like the eco-feminists, the eco-justice advocates believe that the devastation to the environment is inseparable from the social and economic uh, devastation wrought by uh, social and economic injustice. The term, term eco-justice itself was coined by American Baptist Association leaders Richard Jones and Owen Owens in 1973. But the movement is ecumenical as it draws proponents from among Jews, Catholics, and most mainline Protestant denominations while it reaches out to other major religions throughout the world. Even some conservative denominations like Southern Baptists have environmental programs and initiatives. In that same year that the term eco-justice was coined, 1973, the eco-justice project and network arose at Cornell, coordinated by William Gibson, not the science fiction author William Gibson, it's another one. In 1985, Gibson defined eco-justice as, quote, the well-being of humankind on a thriving earth, unquote. This meant a sustainable planet, quote, productive of sufficient food, with water fit for all to drink, air fit to breathe, forests kept replenished, renewable resources continually renewed, non-renewable resources used as sparingly as possible so that they'll be available to future generations. On a thriving earth, providing sustainable sufficiency for all, Human well-being is nurtured not only by the provision of these material necessities, 
but also by a way of living within the natural order that is fitting, respectful of the integrity of natural systems and of the worth of non-human creatures, appreciative of the beauty and mystery of the world of nature." Unquote. That's 1985, that's William Gibson. Eco-justice plays an important role, as you may imagine, in divinity schools and theological seminaries, where it usually takes the form of a program, a center, an uh, institute, or a forum on religion and ecology, as it does, for example, at both Yale and Harvard. I see I'm confining myself to Ivy League schools, but they're, they're uh, uh, in other schools as well, other seminaries didn't mean to do that. Uh, confusingly, the prefix eco in eco-justice and the word ecology in the formation religion and ecology is a gesture toward the environment rather than towards ecological science. Uh, but this conflation of ecology with the environment is common in the environmental movement and in public discourse today. So. Uh, just have to live with it. To compound the terminological confusion, eco-justice is sometimes confused with environmental justice. Environmental justice is a progressive political movement for social justice. It's in opposition to environmental racism, which is shorthand for the unjust impacts of environmental hazards on the poor and on people of color. Eco-justice is more inclusive than environmental justice. It's ecocentric not anthropocentric. To achieve eco-justice in a sustainable world, Hessel argues that humans must do several things, among which are these. Protect the commons against pollution and enclosure. Carefully steward scarce resources and fairly distribute their benefits. Preserve biodiversity. Achieve social and political justice. And deliver environmental justice to the vulnerable. In extending the idea of eco-justice to the earth and all its beings, the eco-justice movement would, in my view, do well to consider these beings, including plants, non-human animals, landforms, and so forth, as persons, with the justice and rights that persons deserve. Needless to say, this is not how we in the modern Euro-American world usually think of justice. We extend only limited rights to beings outside the human world, as, for example, in our laws against excessive cruelty to the higher animals. According to Roman law, from which Euro-American law derives, and in particular, according to the codes of Justinian, justice renders every person and group what they are due, that is, what they deserve or what they are owed. That remains the legal sense of justice in the Euro-American world. Distributive justice considers the way goods, benefits, and harms in a society are distributed. But people differ over what is justly deserved. Political conservatives tend to think of justice as the law, the power structure that a state enforces its citizens to obey. Progressive thinks, uh, progressives think in terms of redistributive or corrective justice in which goods, benefits, and harms are distributed to members of society based on the ethical principles of fairness or egalitarianism. For progressives, justice, often termed social justice, is informed by John Rawls' difference principle, namely that social, cultural, environmental, and economic inequalities should be arranged for the greater benefit of the lesser advantaged. And so justice is both a legal term and an ethical term. We speak, for example, of the moral law or a higher law of conscience. When considering mass incarceration, for example, progressives speak of moral rights and natural rights, as well as legal ones. The eco-justice movement is progressive and works toward social justice, but in its ecocentricity, it extends moral and legal rights to the natural environment as a whole, proclaiming that justice and human well-being is impossible without the well-being of the environment and all of its creatures animals, human and non-human, plants, landforms, and the earth itself. Although the eco-justice movement appeals to many environmentalists, members of mainline religions, and academics, these are not exclusive categories, the movement has failed to galvanize the American public as a whole. And there are at least four reasons why. One, 
Climate change is remote from most people's daily lives, except when environmental disasters intrude. Two, many in the eco-justice movement romanticize nature. They are open to indigenous ecological knowledges, but in thinking of nature as a metaphor for the uncorrupted or in treating indigenous thought as spiritual wisdom, eco-justice leaders underestimate the practical applications of traditional ecological knowledges, those that enabled indigenous populations to sustain themselves and adapt to, to changing habitats for millennia. Third, although the eco-justice movement draws environmental wisdom from all the major religions of the world, the eco-justice movement does not engage effectively with Christian conservatives and evangelicals with whom they might have a lively discussion over Christian history and doctrine and its relation to the environment. For example, they might discuss what is meant in Genesis when God directs humans to have dominion over the creatures of the earth. <clears throat> Does having dominion mean to subdue and dominate them? And has this interpretation of Genesis served to rationalize the history of Euro-American exploitation of nature, as Lynn White argued in a famous 1967 article? Or on the contrary, does having dominion carry with it the responsibilities of stewardship, as good rulers or good stewards of their land and subjects, as some liberal theologians argue? And fourth, the people who comprise the eco-justice movement have not engaged as effectively as they might with rural inhabitants who make their living from the natural world and who have a direct economic stake in its future. These are people whose work brings them daily into intimate relations with natural resources, such as water, trees, and the land. And among them are coal miners, timber cutters, and loggers, ranchers, oil and gas drillers, farmers, foresters, construction workers, and those who fish for a living as well as the families and communities they support. Many of these people and communities feel frustrated and left behind by the global economy. They blame the mammoth corporations. They blame the government. They blame the media. They blame the liberals. They blame the intellectuals. And last but not least, they blame the environmentalists. It's incumbent on the eco-justice movement to engage with these constituencies and see where we can find common ground, not by arguing endlessly over facts they may not want to believe, like anthropogenic climate change, but by appealing to the sense of who they are. After all, urbanites who live green lives do so partly because that is the kind of person that they want to be. In fact, many of these, most of these rural inhabitants are well aware of the effects of environmental pressures, and many endorse and practice their own kinds of environmental conservation. The eco-justice movement would do well to pay attention to them, to their traditional ecological knowledges, and to folk life specialists who have worked with these folk groups for many decades, and who know something about collaboration and partnership, as well as their traditional ecological knowledges and practices. Normally, where scarce natural resources are concerned, conservation is pitted against economic development. Local stakeholders vote with their pocketbooks, resenting outside experts and government regulations. But when the debate is reframed to emit local place-based ecological knowledge, citizens are empowered and the, cons and the conversation may move towards a solution. Public ecology is one name for sustainable development planning that elevates local knowledge of folk groups to expert status. Environmental resource management practiced by tradition-bearing stakeholders counts for a great deal in public ecology. Two examples will have to suffice here, although Mary Hufford, who has done much pioneering work in this area, may wish to explore the relations between public ecology, commons, and eco-justice in greater detail soon. My first example concerns sustainable forest management. <clears throat> in Italy to produce wood for violins. You've all heard of the famous Stradivarius violins, but you may not know that the small Italian forest that produced the spruce and maple to build these violins has been managed sustainably for nearly 300 years by a coalition of violin makers, local businessmen, and foresters, each bringing expert knowledge into the planning. You've all tasted Maine lobsters. I hope you have. 
but you may not know that the fishery commons off the coast of Deer Isle, where I live, is managed by a coalition of stakeholders, including fishermen and women, along with state and federal experts and regulators. Dragging the ocean bottom for scallops off the coast disturbs the lobster breeding grounds, and they must be managed for the benefit of both the lobster and the scallop industries. When the state regulators managed by severely limiting the scallop catch, the scallop fishermen uh, howled. A local fisherman and citizen scientist, Ted Ames, decided a different approach was needed. He interviewed tradition-bearing elders to learn the locations of the richest lobster breeding grounds. He found that the best information came from stories that the elders told in conversation uh, about these places in what Mary Hufford calls a narrative ecology. When the narrative ecology Ames gathered was input into the planning process, instead of the severe general limitation on the scallop catch, only those rich lobster breeding areas were placed off limits to the scallop draggers. This resulted in better harvests and a more sustainable fishery for all. Ames, by the way, later received a MacArthur Genius Grant to further his research into lobster breeding. Here then are two examples of citizen input of place-based ecological knowledges from folk groups that resulted in sustainable management of resource industries. Instead of pitting the ecocentric against the anthropocentric, a successful public ecology was able to serve both ends of ecological responsibility and social justice, that is eco-justice, to the extent that the forest in Italy and the fishery in down east Maine have thus far been able to survive and support the local populations. As Mary Hufford and Betsy Taylor emphasize, public ecology is a collaborative and, quote, multi-sector approach to the study and management of complex socio-ecological systems, one that is reframing expert-driven environmental research and decision-making, unquote. Cultural sustainability is the name many folklorists now employ for the conservation of traditional expressive cultural ecosystems. My sustainability epiphany came in 2004 when the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association's Common Ground Country Fair invited me to bring friends and neighbors to demonstrate an old-time string band jam session. <clears throat> A little drama here. This, this is a, <coughs> you all know who I am. Uh, this is, this is a, a Maine Organic Farmers Gar and Gardeners Association sweatshirt. Uh, I think you can recognize the fruit that's uh, on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, they, they have an annual fair, all right, it's an organic farming fair. It lasts for three days, it attracts 80,000 uh, 80, people, that's quite a lot, and it's billed as a celebration of sustainable living. Uh, and we've played music. We've demonstrated an old-time music jam session at this fair every year since 2004. And we've demonstrated it there alongside the livestock and the produce and uh, the crafts exhibits uh, as a demonstration of another aspect of sustainable living. Besides, in most years since 1981, I've grown a large organic vegetable garden and uh, tended an apple orchard. Organic gardening is all about building and sustaining the soil. And whether it's garden soil or cultural soil or life itself, the ecological principles are pretty much the same. In that epiphany, I realized that sustainability might offer some advantages over conservation as a way to think about the futures of traditional music and expressive culture. After spending my sabbatical in 2004 and 2005 researching sustainability in developmental economics and conservation biology, I should say I had another project that I had told the dean I was going to research, but uh, I just shelved it and, uh, and <coughs> researched uh, sustainability in the two discourses that were uh, important and prevalent at that time, uh, economics and, and uh, conservation biology. And in, by 2006, I felt ready to present three papers introducing an ecological approach to musical and cultural sustainability. And first was the Nettle Lecture at the University of Illinois in the spring. The second for our American Folklore Society in a panel 
Uh, and uh, the third, a panel that I had organized for the Society for Ethnomusicology, a panel on music and sustainability. And the papers from that panel were published three years later in a special issue of the uh, World of Music in 2009. Also in 2009, after much planning, the Goucher College MA program in cultural sustainability was established under the leadership of Rory Turner. Four years after that, in 2013, cultural sustainability became the main theme of our Folklore Society's annual conference. So uh, it snowballed, I guess you could say. <clears throat> Although this work on behalf of cultures is analogous to work in sustaining natural ecosystems, its philosophical underpinnings remain under-theorized. Environmental philosophy in the United States starts from Thoreau's e ecocentric pre premise that humans are inhabitants of nature, not merely inhabitants of civil culture or society. A hundred years later, Aldo Leopold developed what he called his land ethic, Leopold's land ethic is an early version of eco-justice, and it's often cited by environmentalists. He argued that humans are not only citizens of a village or a city or a state and a nation, but are also citizens of the land and the environment as a whole, with the responsibilities, rights, and obligations in relation to the environment that citizenship entails. In the 21st century, Leopold's land ethic has become ecological citizenship. In a 2017 manifesto, that is this year, Joe Gray, Ian White, and Patrick Curry defined ecological citizenship as that which recognizes the intrinsic value in ecosystems and the Earth ecosphere as a whole. Human needs are secondary to those of the Earth as the sum of its ecosystems. Quote, if you see the destruction of a mountaintop for mining as being a deeper wrong, than merely reducing the amenity value of the landscape, they write, then, quote, you are thinking ecocentrically, unquote. Compare Thoreau, 155 years earlier, in his essay on wild apples, quote, there is thus about all natural products a certain volatile and ethereal quality which represents their highest value and which cannot be vulgarized or bought and sold. Unquote. But how do humans learn to feel the sense of responsibility, not only toward one another, but also toward the environment? In a soon-to-be-published essay, Rory Turner writes that a foundation for cultural sustainability work rests in participation and empathy. Culture, normally conceived of as a property of social groups, for Turner becomes instead a field of participation, one that may be characterized by care and empathy, or by violence and neglect. Only the former leads to mutual sustainability. Culture sustains us as we sustain culture. Note, if you will, how Turner invokes the place, community, and participation fields of an ecological rationality here. In my view, an ecocentric reframing will extend sociability, empathy, and care, along with citizenship and responsibility to all beings in the environment. The 20th century gave humanists the idea that nature is a socially constructed category. Timothy Morton's book, Ecology Without Nature, is the logical outcome of that way of thinking. But in the 21st century, an ecological rationality blurs the distinctions between cultural and natural in an ecocentric reframing, not, a, not culture swallowing nature. One based in connection, empathy, and a sociability that includes everyone and everything in the environment. I turn now to the traditional ecological knowledge of a folk group I visited with for more than 25 years, the old regular Baptists of southeastern Kentucky. As Christians, they ought to be of interest to the eco-justice movement. Of course, they're, they're a fairly obscure group. Uh, this is not the same group who were the focus of my collaborative works titled Powerhouse for God. That group was Arminian or free will <clears throat> in doctrine and the old regulars are a different denomination with a Calvinist heritage and a Calvinist doctrine. In total, they number about 15,000. Their churches are found in the coal mining regions of central Appalachia, chiefly in southeastern Kentucky and southwestern Virginia. 
I first met them in 1979 at a conference on rural hymnody that took place at Berea College. And then in 1990, when I was, became a visiting professor of Appalachian Studies at Berea College, I spent most of my Sundays with them, learning about their ways of singing, praying, preaching, and being in the world. At their request, we collaborated over the years to help preserve their tradition of lined out hymnody, the oldest English language music and oral tradition in the United States, a way of singing that derives from the English parish churches in the 1500s. I haven't made a film about them, I haven't written a book about them, but Smithsonian Folkways published two CDs of their music from my field recordings. I wrote a few articles about them. I helped present them at the Smithsonian Folk Festival and accompanied them to two conferences on lined out hymnody at Yale. We still visit each other regularly in Maine as well as Kentucky. That is, they, uh, I visit them in Kentucky and they come to Maine to visit me. Some of them do anyway. And I sing with them whenever I get a chance. Recall my proposal that an ecological rationality is based in the principle of interconnected relation and recall the fields of community place, participation, and nature, human nature. In their life ways and beliefs, old regular Baptists exemplify this ecological rationality. First, the principle of interconnected relation. They're unwilling to evangelize, for example, except with people that they already are connected with friends, family, neighbors, and townspeople. They frequently use organic metaphors for interconnection when they speak. So, for instance, their churches cannot legitimately spring off as entirely new entities. Instead, they must be, as they say, armed off from other churches. Here is what Elwood Cornett and I.D. Back said about it. in conversation with me and John Walhauser back in 1990, and it exemplifies this principle of interconnected relation. A church, I think every church ought to have organization, it ought to be come from somewhere. I don't, I don't much like this jumping off and running out and building a church without any foundation. Of course, inherent in that is very obvious to you, I'm sure, is that we, we believe that there needs to be a chain or there needs right. to be a, a history or there needs to be a what do you say, a, a, a relationship back to a solid trunk. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, We're the, a branch of a trunk, a tree, you know, exactly you got right. Branches on the trunk of a solid tree, armed off, these are rooted in a community with a history and tied to place, a particular physical location. Each family has or had a home place. Cornette and Back spoke to us about that relation that they feel about place and community this way. <laughs> I was born in that house right there. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, that's not to say anything negative about any other place or, no. or particularly about our kind of churches and other places. I've really enjoyed being oh, yes. uh, at some of them. But there is something about place for me. Uh, there's, there's a kind of a camaraderie or, or fellowship that we feel among our people that, that I don't really see everywhere. And, and even I've, I've got neighbors around that, uh, that don't go to church. And, and when trouble comes, they are right here. You know. Place and community comprise the first field of an ecological rationality. The second field is participation. And here I want to contrast the participatory with the presentational, drawing on Tom Torino's distinction between the two, which is actually an old idea for folklorists. The ideal folk group is a participatory community, sharing a commons of traditional knowledge and praxis. Among the old regulars, as with other groups descended from the dissenter wing of the Protestant Reformation, participation is extremely important. Here is what Elwood Cornett said about that. We don't plan. Worship in the Lord is a, is a participatory kind of thing. It's not for us to stand up there and these folks to sit down here and keep their mouth shut and, and, and so forth and, and, and we're to tell them how it is. That's not the way it is. We've got a job, they've got a job. Everybody at Blackie today had a job to do. They, at least, they sing, they, uh, hopefully they pray for us. 
and that place, that sense of place and that sense of community comes back into play with that. On television, you don't have the place and you don't have the, the community and nor the communion back and forth. I use the word communion there to talk about the relationship back and forth between different people, whether it's a preacher or whoever. Here, Elwood Cornet links participation with relation and with place and with community and communion. I would extend it to commons. And certainly their worship meeting is a field for participation and care to come back to Rory Turner's delineation. The third field in an ecological rationality concerns nature, including plants, animals, and landforms, and its relation to human nature. Their economy is based in the natural resource of coal. It's difficult to imagine a more intimate relation to nature, both beautiful and terrifying, than the experience of mining coal. Many old regular Baptists hunt game, and some gather medicinal plants in the surrounding mountains. Kenzie Eisen, an old regular Baptist preacher I came to know, was part of a cooperative ginseng gathering and exporting operation. Listen to what Elwood Cornett and I.D. Back said about nature and human nature when I interviewed them in 1990. We don't plan. Worship in the Lord. It well, I went the wrong way here. Well, oh. <laughs> all right. Well, certainly if you look out and see the trees today and think that from somewhere water is falling to quench the thirst of the earth. There's a part of nature that is directly the handiwork of God. If you hear the birds singing there, that touches my heart and at least reminds me that God's got control of it all. So there is that element of, of nature, I guess if you want to call it that, and most people would look at it in that way, that is a very positive thing. On the other hand, there was a, a man and a woman in a garden one time who had a nature, or the nature revealed itself of transgressing God's law. And there's a nature about me that says, uh, don't, don't be subservient to anything, the, the spirit or anything. And that gets in my way. And I think, that's the, I think that's the same thing that Paul was talking about with the thorn in the flesh. That nature is the nature that we're going to leave in the grave. That's the nature that makes it difficult for us to get up into the stand and, and try to preach. And that's the nature that would cause us all the trouble that we have. So there, there's different words that have more than one meaning, and I think that's one of them. Yeah, nature, nature is uh, it's human nature. Yeah, human right. nature is mm -hmm. there, and uh, that's why we cry. That's why we laugh. That's why we love. And human nature, then, uh, as long as we live in this house, this earthly house, we'll have that human mm -hmm. nature. Right. Cornet is saying that in the Garden of Eden, it was humankind that fell into sin, not nature that fell into sin. The natural world is God's handiwork directly, he says. Nature is unfallen. Many of the religious leaders of the eco-justice movement would agree even if they think of Genesis as mythology. Others in the eco-justice movement, those who feel an awakening in the presence of nature but who do not identify with any particular religion, might see this as evidence of a larger spirituality. Although many people who feel respect and affection for the natural world do not identify these as religious or spiritual feelings. Regardless of its origin, it's clear that the traditional ecological knowledge of old regular Baptists is profound. They understand relation and interconnectedness, and they practice stewardship in their daily lives. They venerate place and community as a site for participation and caring. And they see a particular relation between nature and human nature, one that is not so far away from Thoreau's idea of humans as inhabitants of nature, or Leopold's land ethic and proposal that humans ought to think of ourselves as citizens of nature. In short, they contribute an ecological rationality to eco-justice, and the eco-justice movement would do well to pay attention to their traditional ecological knowledge 
as well as the ecological knowledge of other folk groups that many of you have, have, uh, have worked with. I've said that I would conclude this talk on eco-justice um, by gesturing toward my sound ecology project. Sound plays a critical role in the ecological knowledge of the old regular Baptists. Sound, they say, has a drawing power. The sound of their preaching, praying, and singing is musical. They sing their sermons. And this is unusual among non-African Americans. The peculiar sacred sounds of this, particular, of this peculiar people are comforting. And the sounds draw them back home if they must migrate out temporarily for better wages. Sound also keeps them together. It is both ontological and epistemological. That is, sound for them is a way of being in the world and a way of knowing the world. It is also, most importantly, a way of connecting with one another. Elwood Cornett explained it this way, quote, it seems to me that there's something innate about the sound that we have in the way that we sing. There's some kind of a special connection, and somehow that's released by that sound, unquote. Those of you who've heard me present aspects of my sound ecology project during the past few years, uh, twice at these AFS conferences, by the way, won't need to be reminded of it. But I would like to gesture toward it as I conclude this presentation, because it is congruent with eco-justice. That is, eco-justice is one of its outcomes. As you know, the dominant epistemology among Westerners derives from the Cartesian separation of self from object, in which the thinking being contemplates the external world. This separation has enabled humans to engineer the world, but this instrumental rationality has come at the expense of our full sensory connection to it. And in the absence of feeling and knowing that humans are a part of nature, humans have done the planet and its beings, including ourselves, great harm. Furthermore, an instrumental rationality not only exploits the natural world, but by especially identifying women and people of color with nature, toxic Western masculinity takes license to exploit them as well. As Karen J. Warren writes, quote, ecological feminism is the position that there are important connections between how one treats women, people of color, and the underclass on one hand, and how one treats the non-human natural environment on the other, unquote. My area for more than 50 years has been music and sound. And so I ask, what happens when people know the world through sounds? What, in other words, are the epistemological implications of starting with sound worlds rather than with object worlds or text worlds. To put it yet another way, what happens if for the moment we abandon the idea that we humans are thinking subjects experiencing a separate external world of objects to manipulate, as scientists and engineers do? And what if we abandon the idea that we are thinking subjects experiencing the world as texts or as performances to analyze and interpret, as humanists do? What if, for the moment, we think of ourselves as subjects experiencing the world as sounding beings. For sounding beings are interconnected both viscerally through sound vibrations and metaphorically in a personal relation. If we start with sound worlds, how might the resulting communities, economies, and ecologies differ from those as humans conceive them as present, at present? Is it thus possible to erect a just alternative to the alienated communities, neoliberal politics, neoclassical economies, and neo-Darwinian ecologies that drive humans toward injustice and the planet toward extinction. I think it is possible. I think doing so puts us on a path of sound ecological rationality, which I trust will lead every being to eco-justice in a more sustainable world. Briefly then, here are the principles of a sound-centered ecology. One, sound is experienced as presence in the world. Sound says, here I am, or there you are. Two, sound connects. Sound connects beings bodily, because, one, when, one being sounds a, <laughs> because when one being sends a sound signal and another being receives the sound signal, they vibrate at the same frequency. Sound connects beings through the plant and animal world, 
to facilitate communication among them, from the simple signals of honeybees to blueberry plants to enable pollination for their mutual benefit, to the complex symbolic, metaphorical, and ambiguous symbols and signals of human languages, including music. Three, a sound connection among beings establishes co-presence, mutual awareness, and a personal relationship among co-beings. This co-presence leads to a community of beings connected to one another. When one body sets another body in motion through sound, physicists call the phenomenon sympathetic vibration. Taking this as a metaphor is but a short step from sympathy to empathy, the basis for a sound community and a sound economy based in personal responsibility. A sound economy of empathetic beings is a far cry from the neoclassical economic conception of rational self-interested beings competing to maximize personal wealth while entering into economic contracts governed by the laws of the state. That is the conservative interpretation of justice. I might add as an aside that the Nobel Prize in Economics was just awarded to a behavioral economist who proved, if proof ever was needed, that humans don't always act rationally in their economic self-interest. Eco-justice, on the other hand, is based in ecological responsibility. I interpret this, as many indigenous peoples do, to mean that all beings are connected. In rituals, sound establishes the connections between the human and the spirit worlds, whether among indigenous people singing for power, or among Pentecostals speaking in tongues, or old regular Baptists singing their sermons and prayers, or the black preacher hooping in the spirit of God. Thinking of the world as texts or as objects does not bring us directly into co-presence and community as sound does. To conclude then, if all beings are connected, then all beings are related. That is, all beings are our kin. We are all responsible toward one another. This is ecological responsibility. Being in the world and knowing the world through sound connects us and opens a space for the empathy, sociability, and the participatory public ecology that Hufford and Turner advocate. Instead of holding foremost the personal rights and obligations of liberty and property, we elevate the rights and obligations of connection, kinship, and mutual responsibility, and we recognize that they extend to all beings in the world as persons. And this, for me, is the essence of eco-justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. And now we're going to um, continue with um, Mary and Rory. I'm going to give a brief introduction to both of them and then um, just let them proceed. Mary's going to go first. Um, when you were speaking, I was thinking I spent the last weekend in Lyme, New Hampshire, um, and I was embraced by bear cubs for the first time in my life, bear hugs. And the person that I know there that works with um, orphan bears, um, his whole philosophy of managing them and eventually releasing them back in the wild involves with understanding that they are beings and that you communicate with them with sound. It's really very interesting to me. So, second here. Um, so first of all, for Mary Hufford, um, over the past three decades, folklorist Mary Hufford has worked in government, academic, and nonprofit settings as folklife specialist at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress. Um, from 1982 to 2002, she led regional team fieldwork projects in the New Jersey Pine Barrens and the Southern West Virginia coal fields. From 2002 to 2012, she served on the graduate faculty of folklore and folklife at the University of Pennsylvania 
directing the Center for Folklore and Ethnography from 2002 to 2008. <coughs> Her scholarship, learning, and community-based fieldwork have consistently explored interrelations of folk life in the natural world. She holds an appointment on the faculty of the master's program in cultural sustainability and environmental studies, um, a Guggenheim Fellow and a Fellow of the American Folklore Society. She is author of Chase World, Fox Hunting and Storytelling in New Jersey's Pine Barrens, editor of Conserving Culture, a New Discourse on Culture, and has published numerous monographs and articles on folklore and the cultural dimensions of environmental crisis. And Roy Turner is Assistant Professor, Department of Anthropology and Sociology at Goucher College, and founder of Goucher's Master of Arts in Cultural Sustainability Program. Rory formerly directed the Folk and Traditional Arts Program of the Maryland State Arts Council and is um, interested in applied public folklore, which uses folklore and traditional cultural materials to solve real-world social problems. He's a widely known author and scholar and thinker, so go ahead, <laughs> Mary. Thank you, Maggie. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I'd like to thank the Folk Belief and Religious Folk Life section, and especially Maggie Crusey and Leonard Permiano for inviting Jeff Todd Titan to deliver this, this evening's uh, Don Yoder lecture, uh, and for inviting um, me and Rory Turner to comment. Of course, Jeff's work has for decades shaped a clearing, or to use as Jeff does, Rory Turner's turn, term, field of participation in which ecologically minded folklorists are beginning to pitch our tent. Jeff's development of the principle of ecological rationality in the lecture we just listened to um, firmly locates a few primary stakes to which we can tether our guy, our guy lines uh, for that tent. Um, community place, participation, and nature, human nature. It remains for us to design and inhabit our tent I hope you brought your sleeping bags. Just kidding, I won't talk that long. Seriously, however, at the risk of pushing the metaphor too far, I want to think with all of you about how some of these stakes for securing our tent have gained considerable clarity through Jeff's discussion of eco-justice and folk life. The world Jeff envisions here, one in which we behave as if we actually believed what we know to be true, that all beings are interconnected and that harm to any one being harms all beings, entails, um, as he says, a significant reframing project. And he does not pretend that this will be easy. As Jeff indicates, there are precedents for this reframing in the ways in which major ecological thinkers have seen the world, ways that undermine some of the epistemological and ontological obstacles to eco-justice, partly by recognizing the role played by folk life. Uh, practices that function as what I like to call the matrices of cultural and ecological renewal. Aldo Leopold's notion of the land community, a system created and renewed through collaborations of human and more than human others, is widely embraced by ecologists, but have folklorists done enough to persuade ecologists that folk life is a key, is a key concept for interdisciplinary collaboration? One of the problems we face here is the problem of cultural relativism, illustrated in the concept for, of traditional ecological knowledge, or tech, as it's known, a concept increasingly criticized for its imposition of the categories of Western science onto indigenous life worlds, which are thereby ontologically dismembered. Systematized, publicly sanctioned ontological dismemberment is among the many injustices for which eco-justice is the, is the remedy. Notice that in dividing a knowledge that is ecological from other kinds of knowledge, uh, tech also perpetuates the very nature-culture dichotomy and its trusty companion, the subject-object dichotomy, which Jeff is urging us to dismantle. Dismantling these is necessary to the ecocentric reframing that Jeff proposes, but as Jeff's examples also show, these categories of nature uh, well, the category of nature remains heuristically useful. So, 
I think that what we tend to forget is that these dotted lines dividing nature and from culture, subject from object, are in practice not absolutely fixed, but are mutable, permeable, and, and ephemeral. Constrained by the institutions we serve, which are propped up by these dualisms, um, those divide, we, we find those divides very difficult to bridge. The examples presented here from Jeff's fieldwork model the sort of dismantling that is called for and the precise nature of folklore's contribution. Jeff's deference to the imminent, I mean immanent, theories of nature and human nature exemplifies the troubling of the divide between subject and object. We are plunged into a world-making event unfolding through a conversation between an ethnomusicologist and several members of the old regular Baptist community into which Jeff is being initiated. What is of great interest to me, though Jeff does not explicitly draw attention to it, cuts to the heart of what folk life has to contribute to eco-justice. The relationship between we folklorists and our collaborators in world making is structured as our mutual appropriation by conversational genres. In this case, the genre um, is one that first caught my attention in Charles Briggs's work, Competence and Performance, The Scriptural Illusion. Elwood Cornett appeals to the book of Genesis to illuminate the difference between a nature that is unfallen and a human nature that has fallen. Elsewhere, <clears throat> Cornett seems to allude to the role of old regular Baptist hymnody in addressing this problem by establishing and enacting a state of communion. Everybody at Blackie today had a job to do. They sang. Hopefully they prayed for us. And that place, that sense of place, and that sense of community comes back into play with that. Other comments suggest that the sense of community is dependent on the natural setting. My inclination is to bring Elwood Cornett here into dialogue with Mikhail Bakhtin, who <clears throat> steeped in uh, Russian Orthodox Kenotic tradition, um, as, his, as his biographers Katrina Clark, as Clark and Hulkless put it, he saw the salient distinction not as that between soul and body, mind and matter, nature and spirit, but between flesh fallen and flesh transfigured. When the old regular Baptists turn from their hymns back to the mines and fields, when we fall out of conversations laced with scriptural illusions, um, we leave the state of transfiguration that holds us together in community. We turn our attention to something else, and that world that we sustain through our attention uh, falls, just lapses. It's not there. We're not attending to it. Okay. Um, it is trans... It, okay. <clears throat> now, an understanding of how ordinary interactional routines form thresholds for passing from relatively disconnected to highly connected modes of experience, whether those routines engage us with others who are... We need an, an understanding. Uh, that's what folklore can contribute, is an understanding of how ordinary interactional routines form thresholds for passing from relatively disconnected to highly connected modes of experience um, and what we might call ecological rationality. Whether those routines engage us with others who are humans or with others who are more than human. Um, on first reading Jeff's lecture, I was surprised to find that uh, not to, I was surprised not to find more discussion of explicit relationships established between human, humans and more than humans in particular natural settings, although it, it is implicit uh, and it is referred to. This is something that folklorists have certainly addressed in place-based studies of folk arts and community life. Jeff's definition of ecological rationality allows greater leeway for the study of how ecological rationality finds expression uh, through principles of interconnection and relationship hardwired into all life systems. We see here how more than human others are good to think with and to interact with. The description of how that thinking and interacting is structured across species is a project to which folk life has much to contribute. One of the distinctions drawn between anthropology and folklore is that while anthropology came of age in the context of empire building, folklore grew out of the regionalizing work entailed by nation building. 
Jeff's reference to the ginseng cooperative formed by the old regular Baptists points to ginsenging, <clears throat> uh, draws our attention to ginsenging, which is a historically distinctive eco-cultural practice in central Appalachia, um, found throughout central Appalachia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, Virginia. In fact, I, I was reminded of an article published by James Haught in 1997 in the Charleston Gazette about a group of Baptists who, unable to resolve a dispute over scripture, ended up attacking each other with sang hose. <laughs> Homemade implements used for digging the valuable ginseng roots native to the region. Alas, care and empathy was overcome <laughs> by violence. But, um, but I was also reminded of Robert Cantwell's definition of region as the ecological limit of, eco of ethnomimetic process. The ecological limit of ethnomimetic process, which is his term for folk life. Let's just put it that way. The scriptural illusion that came up in Jeff's e exploration of kinds of nature with Elwood Cornett exemplifies a kind of ethnomimetic process that folklorists can track. I'll provide an example from my own work with which I conclude an article in the same volume as the one Rory's article will appear in. Um, in the mid-1990s, I was working with forest ecologists on a citizen science forest monitoring project in southern West Virginia, documenting the cultural implications of forest species decline. Science writer John Flynn and I were exploring the symptoms of this decline in conversation with a preacher and members of the congregation of the Delbert Free Will Baptist Church. Offering a scriptural illusion, the preacher said, I'll give you a possible reading on why trees are doing the way they're doing. It says in the Bible that if man don't cry out to God against injustice, the rocks and the trees will. Satan knows that, and that's why he's using these companies to destroy them. Not only does the scriptural illusion here contrast the thirst for justice expressed by rocks and trees, clearly unfallen <laughs> here except by Satan's hand, with the lack of that thirst in humans. The preacher uses this to suggest that there is something diabolical about mountaintop removal mining, which you also mentioned. Um, the illusion in the context of this conversation, bridges the nature-culture subject-objects divides, making rocks and trees the protagonists and advocates for humanity. The illusion, a genre of performance, functions ecocentrically as what I call a tiny matrix for ecological and cultural renewal. The setting for this illusion was a cross-disciplinary, multi-sectoral conversation. In the standard practice of folklore's phenomenological ethnography, we all loaned ourselves, as Jeff does with Elwood Cornett, to the scriptural illusion, which appropriates us according to principles of the sort of ecological rationality cultivated within those fields of participation, care, and empathy that Jeff has so beautifully elaborated this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Stay up here. Stay up here. Just have a seat So, hello, everybody. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to thank Jeff um, for this paper. But um, I think. I think, as Mary said so eloquently, you know, there's a kind of field of engagement with questions that move us beyond the kind of disciplinary silos that we might find ourselves in um, that I think you've, you've invited uh, many people to. And um, we've, it, it's as if we are at a time where um, an ecology is collapsing and new, new seeds need to find a, a home and, and a place to grow. And I think that some of the work that you've done has given us some, um, 
some 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 ways to to really start to cultivate that space. Um, so, as I was listening to you and um, noting with raptured, dazzled attention your shirt, I thought of the apple, and um, I wish I could give you an apple um, as a teacher. Uh, uh, as that is, you know, the kind of uh, one traditional gift that we have, and um, and I think it's a very it's a very powerful image for us, um, and and it's a powerful image because it is it is a a a, a vehicle for the expression of something human that is in this in-between space that um, I, I think we call clumsily in some ways, or I feel like we, we th there's pr a problem with this term, but the term the gift, right? Um, you know, we give the apple as a gift, but I think we think we know what gifts are, but I think that what was so um, dazzling about Marcel Mauss and his work with the gift was to see that there was a kind of world building in these interactions that could not be reduced to um, some sort of simple interpretation or instrumental rationality, that there was something else going on here. And, and so, you know, I think all of the, the reflection on eco-justice and moving upstream from mind-body dualism to a, a, a kind of uh, a liberation, a phenomenological liberation of modes of being is, 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 it takes us into that realm. It takes us into the realm of the gift. And so I was thinking, well, what, what, is, what is the nature of, um, of this gift that, that Jeff is giving us? And um, what I, 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 the term that keeps coming to me is, is gentleness, um, that there is a kind of gentle offering from one, m one tradition, a, an, an academic tradition to something that may be emerging, a different kind of academic tradition. And um, I think one of the things that, that I have felt in thinking about um, these matters, really going back to my time at the Maryland State Arts Council, was that that which we as folklorists have been engaged with is placed squarely in the heart of what is needed for a, 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 an, eco, an eco just world. So I want to, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of short on time, so I'm going to just, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about this and, and, you know, to use this great felicitous pun that you've shared with us, you know, of sound, you know, a sound ecology is both a, a ecology of a sound, but also one that can be sound in the sense of, of uh, uh, having integrity and resilience, which is another topic that you've helped really uh, open my eyes to. Um, I think about a sound pedagogy. So we are, you know, the sort of, uh, uh, we have, you know, if the anthropologists used to have the savage slot and now have embraced the suffering slot and, you know, th there's a move to sort of say we're, we're looking now at the anthropology of the good, which is, I think, all to the good and, and is actually quite resonant with what you're saying, Jeff. Um, we folklorists have had the, the sort of the folk slot. We have had looking at these ways of people interacting um, under the sign of the gift, you know, uh, 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 interchanges, um, participations that even when they are accompanied by monetary exchange are not really motivated by that monetary exchange, you know, at least Maybe you know that's romantic, but I think it's actually true that 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 it is about knitting together the world into a fabric. Um, and sometimes that is you know it is it can be violent, it can be awful, but it is also where I think 
the, <coughs> the, 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 you know, the kind of the, 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 the fibers of, um, of, of an integrated social, cultural, and ecological commons can emerge. So if we're, if we're sort of the stewards of that, um, what are the ways that we teach about that? Well, I don't think that we should just dismember those things as, you know, in, in our capacity to analyze objectively as texts or as objects. I think we need to do that because that is, you know, it, it's like in any kind of, you know, if you're learning a musical instrument, you need to break some things down and think about things in ways, but that's not playing together. What would playing together look like? What would be the ways that we could help our students to pay attention in close ways to the, the human worlds and the ecological worlds that they find themselves in? I think it is in that paying attention where something shifts. And it's funny, I just look at Kara, at, hi. <laughs> In the audience, and I, I remember years back when you started in Maryland Traditions, I said, your job is to love Western Maryland more than anybody else. You know, that's your job. And, um, and that noticing, I think, is something that we need to put in the forefront of our, of our, of our curriculum. And I think also to think that it's not just the forms of you know, academic writing and research that should have value, but the very genres, the, the, the genres that we study are the genres that bring people into relationship. And if we are holding ourselves from participation in them, I think our capacity to actually be in an ethical relationship with the people that we're interested in is compromised. And in that relationship then, I think we have different kinds of projects in store for us than what can be an extractive industry of, of, of meaning making from a transposition from one context to another. So I, I guess I'll leave it at that, but you know, those are just some thoughts on the idea of sound pedagogy. Um, and you know, I'm so grateful for your um, I'm grateful for you in, in, in many ways, but, but um, uh, there's a kind, I, I, I said earlier today that you were generous, and, and I think of generosity in terms of, you know, that sort of root sense of, um, you know, the kind of biological um, uh, reproduction, and well, that could go, that's not exactly, we, I'm not thinking of it quite, all right, let's, Rewind, rewind. Um, metaphorically. metaphorically, but metaphorically in the, in the sense of a kind of generativity of, um, of, of possibility and a generativity that is, you know, is, is, is how ecosystems thrive. And we thrive too in that way and we don't even notice it. So let's teach our students to notice it. Let's teach our students to be able to relate to people that are persisting in, in knowledge and understandings that really we could benefit from. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're really um, very close to being out of time, but what does time matter at this hour of the evening anyway? So we'd, while we're here, we'd um, love it if anyone has comments or questions for Jeff or for Mary or Rory. Um, Jess and Danielle, uh, Jess. Um, yes. Yeah,
me. Uh, oops. <laughs> it's on. Oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yes and no. Uh, I think that uh, everyone bricolages their own ethnography. Uh, and once we have it, we won't need to call it ethnography. It's just being in a relation with, with, with one another and with, uh, with nature, uh, which um, I would extend the, the idea that Rory was mentioning the gift. Uh, nature is a gift to nature and nature is a gift to humans and humans are a gift. To, if, if we think of our relationship with the natural world and all its beings, including human beings, as a gift. Uh, we're not contracted with one another. There's not, it's not a legal system, but we have the personal relationships and responsibilities and rights that gifts confer. You know, you don't, when you get, when you get a gift, you, you give it to someone else. You never sell it. You never sell that gift. Uh, Thoreau understood that. So, uh, yes, we have some, some adequate methods, I believe, um, uh, and no, we don't have enough adequate methods. Everybody, I think, needs to, to, to work their own relationships. Uh, so, and I know you're working yours. So, yeah. Can I add, can, can I sort of riff on that a little bit too? Just, um, uh, I, I, I think that in terms of, of, of the toolkit, you know, everything, you know, everything from GIS to, you know, big data analysis to, you know, uh, chemical analysis of, of soil, all of those things are good, but if they're not actually grounded in some kind of, like, you know, experiential depth, then, then, then that's where we get into trouble, right? So, so I think, you know, it's, it's possible, especially, you know, pr working pragmatically in terms of, you know, regimes of value that we find ourselves in. But I think the eco-justice thing is pretty radical. What this guy's saying is, like, let's look at it, you know, we have to really move towards looking at it differently. And, and you know, then, then the picture changes. Both. Uh, it, it did no, I did notice them. I, I had uh, spoken with them about strip mining and, and mining and black lung from, from an environmental perspective. Uh, but I believe that as I thought about an ecological rationality as opposed to an economic or instrumental rationality, when I reread and rehear what they say it takes on a, a much um, a much more um, resonant connected uh, kind of meaning and I, I, I think that this happens to a lot of us as it's almost as if these interactions in our field work plant the seeds that Rory was talking about, and then uh, they grow, and we come back to them. Uh, and, and now we do this. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Henry James' story, The Figure in the Carpet, where um, he talks about the, the dangers of, of finding a pattern, because five years later you'll find another pattern. But they're, 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 they're both valid patterns. That's what we, that's what we do. You know, we run orders through chaos. 
Not order through chaos, but orders. <laughs> Has that not happened, Danielle, in your own work? And I think one of the things about folklorists, and this has been mentioned, I'm certainly not originating this, is that we, we folklorists have, have worked for years with the constituencies of, of um, people who uh, are angry with the establishment uh, and who, who voted their anger in the last election. Mm -hmm. uh, we're better equipped, I think, than some pundits, journalists, and others to try to understand these folks. Every time I read an article by somebody from New York who went down to Appalachia to, well, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think we know a little better. How do we get our voices heard? I'm not going to use the table metaphor. I can't. Can't stand it anymore. You know, bring something to the table. I just wanted to say I teach a class on sociology and the environment, and a lot of what you said really resonated with what I wrote in that class. And, and you gave me tonight kind of a vocabulary to draw from from folklore, which is my home discipline. And I can't wait to teach that class in the spring so that I can incorporate all of that. But um, one of the issues. I want to thank Jeff again and Mary and Rory very much. We have just a wonderful evening. Oh, that one. Yes. This man here. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's about, uh, uh, I, it's a metaphor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which you can eat. That's the cool thing about food. But. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed you didn't drop it on my head. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, there would be too much gravitas Thanks. for Thank that. You <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all.